In this special episode of Advocates, the podcast, we pay tribute to the late Datuk Sri Gopal Sriram, who so recently left us. Just last month, Razlan and Michelle had the rare opportunity to spend one and a half hours with him speaking about his life and the law. He truly was an advocate that needed no introduction and we hope you enjoy celebrating his life with us on this episode of Advocates, the podcast. Good morning, Datuk Sri Gopal Sri Ram. Thank you for talking to us this morning on Advocates, the podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me, though I can't understand why you picked me. <laughs> ah, Datuk Sri. Okay. So many others in the basket. Yes, well, there you are. So many others in the basket, but none like you, of course. So I'll just start <laughs> off with some background questions what we normally do with our interviewees about your family background, sir. Could you just tell us your early years, your growing up? Because I know you were born during the Japanese occupation. And what was that like, uh, growing up in Kuala Lumpur during those years? By the time I attained consciousness, I think the Japanese had left. Okay. Now, my father, unlike the other civil servants who came to work here in British Malaya, refused to go back to India. Ramani Bradle, <clears throat> Mr. Bradle, Mr. Ramani and a few others, I think, decided to go back to, go, go to India because it was less of a risk of Japanese invasion in India. But my father decided to stay here and uh, all the family was here. And because it was Japanese occupation, I remember my mother telling me that my brothers had to attend the school in the Japanese school in Malacca. So I have no recollection of that at all. My earliest recollection is that both my elder brothers had left for Australia. My early life was a mixture because I lost my father when I was seven. My mother was a very strong person and she had a huge impact on me. She actually survived a huge lot, a huge amount of uh, problems. We were a middle class family. I think if I did law, I was an accidental lawyer, but I think I owe everything to my mother as far as the early years are concerned. And she had a little bit of money with her. What's the part of her character you think that I suppose influenced you the most in those early years? Couldn't be damned. Sorry? Couldn't be damned. <laughs> right. bother, someone right. asked me this morning. Who do you think will become the Attorney General? I said, don't know, don't care. Right. <laughs> so that you got from your mum. Uh, Dr. Sri, yeah. will you know also that you went to school in Batu Road School and then later on to Victoria Institutions? How were you as a student? What was the young Gopal Sri Ram like in school? I was a terrible student. I was an utterly hopeless student. I think my teachers must have been very frustrated with me, quite justifiably. Right. I didn't, I didn't like my time at VI. I, actually, for four years, I was at KG5, and those were my most memorable years. I enjoyed my life in King George V. In Surumban? Yes, but I think VI, with the Lewis as the headmaster, there was no potential for personal views you know, or development. You either towed the line or you were thrown out. The discipline was very, very strict. I found that unusual after a very relaxed and a much more accommodating life which uh, the teachers in King George V gave us. You see, we were allowed uh, much more freedom of thought and action. Though I, of course, I went to VI because everybody in my house, my family went to VI. All my cousins went to VI, all my brothers went to VI, so I had to go to VI. It was an absolute necessity. It was a family, it was a family requirement. That's why I went to VI. Right. After VI, you became a teacher for of a couple of years before undertaking law. Yeah, I did my A-levels because I formed a great attachment to mathematics after I left VI. I, when I was doing my A-levels, I took a great attachment to mathematics and English. I found both to be quite intriguing. So... My attachment to mathematics still continues today. When I'm bored listening to cross-examination or 
some unnecessary events happening in event happening in court i try to still work out an angle at the center of a circle is twice the angle at the circumference supported by the same one <laughs> that is very interesting that is right because quite a few of the advocates we have interviewed openly confessed that the only reason they did law was because they were quite hopeless in maths but you seem to be the other way around actually actually law and mathematics you're quite right raslan law and mathematics are the two ends of a scale just as music and the mathematics the same end of music and mathematics are the same end of the scale you have to be very good unfortunately that doesn't work with me so what made you then switch careers i mean apart from obviously the financial rewards in, in law is much better than being a teacher teaching maths but what was it that actually resulted in the young gopal sri ram switching from being a teacher in maths to actually going abroad to study law i applied for and was granted a place in the institute of mathematics in perth scotland and i had no independent source of income except right. as a teacher i earned a little bit so i had to rely on my mother and my mother said no way i'm going to pay for your fees if you're going to go and become a mathematics teacher <laughs> okay then i i said no i'll work and i'll earn and i'll go i won't depend on you but i turned out i couldn't do it as i turned around and looked over my shoulder i found among me all my classmates having got some professional qualification come back most of them are lawyers most of them are lawyers my classmates came back as lawyers so i said well why not give it a shot so i bit my teeth and i went and i still remember my first interview by the under treasurer of in lincoln's inn mr ec fatchild i said i'm here under duress you know i'm not here voluntarily so he said give it a try of course those days the bar exams were what you would call a degree exam now we did subjects actual exams in subjects but they were very diff- differently framed uh, for example uh, if you take criminal law as a subject you have to answer one paper and there are 10 questions given in two parts part a and part b you have to answer four in question four in part a four in part b and you have to do it in 3 hours so eight questions in 3 hours as against the llb five questions in 3 hours yeah so we have to think very fast and you have to write very fast and you have to be on the point you see if they say define perjury you have to define perjury if you write anything else you fail oof so it's very very strict it was very strict but uh, what it did was it trained your mind to think straight away so those exams were tough really tough i give you an uh, idea of how tough they were uh, strain wise physical strain wise we used to have on a monday morning at uh, 10 o'clock used to be the common law paper finals finals used to be common law and then the afternoon equity common law was made up of contract tort and criminal law and then interpretation of deeds and statutes those were the four topics and that was part a wow and part b was a whole lot of different subjects you know but you have to you have to be proficient so you did, in other words the chesha and five foot which i used the sixth edition which i used as a textbook for my contract subject became my notebook became my notebook for the final in the second part of common law you had sale of goods and agency i was very fortunate i had professor diamond as my teacher i'll give you an example which he gave us and we'll never forget you see he's dead and gone but i'll never forget he says uh, on sale by a non owner he taught sale of goods in three subjects in th- sorry in three topics he said uh, sale by a non owner rights of a buyer against the seller rights of a seller against a buyer those are the three topics and in sale of a non owner he gave the example i go into a shop to buy a bed a four poster bed and i sign the purchase order and i tell the shopman i tell the, the 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 salesman to deliver the bed the next day and i'll pay for it then i go away and then a very pretty girl comes into the shop and the salesman now forgets about you having seen her and what she does is she pays for the sh- for the bed and has it delivered that very evening to her home so is it la- ladies now gentlemen 
Can you tell me what is the position between you and the lady? Let me tell you straight away that are not joint tenants of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how can you forget an example like that? That's right. That's right. Uh, That's what we are You're not missing. joint tenants Wait. of the bed. <laughs> but did, did you enjoy yourself studying? Very yeah. much. Very much. I mean, it was ter terribly strenuous. It was very, very strenuous. But then one, once when I got used to the the three things in England, number one, you know, London is an unfriendly city. Once you accept that London is unfriendly, and number two, your Malaysians, your fellow Malaysians are your, your first line of defense because we always used to stand together. And then, of course, the third thing is that if you made friends, it was forever. Right. So who are your contemporaries that, those days, Dr. Sri? The uh, Kumarendran from Penang was my contemporary. Kersi Shroff, who until recently worked with the uh, U.S. Library of Congress, was my contemporary. And Adrian de Bourbon, who became additional Solicitor General for the, 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 the then Southern Rhodesia. He was my contemporary. Maharaj, who became the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, was my classmate. Aziz Muhammad was my classmate. Roslan Hashim was my classmate. Roslan was the brightest of all of us. Of all of us, Roslan was the brightest. And Andrew Suratton, who became Speaker of the House, in Trinidad was my classmate and uh, Minister for Law and Parliamentary Affairs of Barbados, Richard Cheltenham, was my classmate. We had classmates from all over the world and we were very close. Were you a hardworking student or were you that the last? No choice. Okay, okay, no choice. Okay. No choice. No choice. I was not a very good student across the board. So I had to really work at it. My contemporaries who would play the fool the whole bloody term. And then just three weeks before the exam, slog and then pass with any, without any difficulty. I couldn't do that. I, I'm, a, I'm a slogger. Right. Even now. So you came back, you passed, you came back. And, and of course, you started looking around for places to, to, to be a pupil in. So where did you end up? Actually, I didn't have any difficulty because it was understood that uh, Mr. Stanley Petty would be my pupil master because he was my mother's... Ah. Solicitor. He was my mother's solicitor from 1951 when he was a legal assistant in Shern Delamo. So there was no question about it. He was a family friend. So Stanley Douglas Kyle Petty became my pupil master by default. But the person I worked with the most and whose company I enjoyed the most was Alexander Jung Lung Lee. Alexander Lee, also known as Alex Lee, who later became yeah. a politician. He was a very good friend of mine. And I, I used to go with him everywhere. So you came back and became a Stanley Paddy's pupil. But did he go to court regularly? Did you, was, was that your first exposure to court work? No, the person who... Stanley was very... He, he chose the kind of work he did. He, he was very careful. So his cases will come up once. He'll have two or three cases a year, you see. Because the type of work he did was extremely complex. So his cases will come up once or two or three times a year. Whereas Alex Lee used to be in court every week. Right. So I used to uh, uh, dress up and go off with him. And he got always got permission from the bench to allow me to sit down and take a note. And he's the one who taught, taught me how to take a note of evidence. Of course, we'd already learned about it in the post-final classes in UK, where yes. we were taught by, uh, by the editor, the then editor of Orgers, after pupillage, then um, what? You then decided to set off on your own, or no, no. I I looked for a job, and then I found that jobs were very very difficult to come by. Mm. But I had a friend of mine who was in practice, so he said, "Come and join me, and do some work for me." And he paid me what was then the salary for legal assistance, which was five hundred dollars. Okay, right. Which was a lot of money uh, because five hundred dollars enabled me to. Uh, keep myself in board and logic. But I, after three years working with him, he, he went off into do, do business. And he was not very successful at that. After three years with him, I started my own, on my own. I worked with uh, the late Tan Sri Chan Chun Tak, who was also my classmate. We also graduated together. 
Suntak was Edgar Joseph's classmate in KG5. Okay. They were they were together. I think St. Paul's. They were classmates in St. Paul's. I can't remember. So through Suntak, I came to know Edgar Joseph. All right. And I was amazed by Edgar Joseph's memory. So one of the first cases I had to do, Razlan, was yes. a criminal criminal trial before one Majid, who was then the first magistrate of the newly established Patalinjaya court. Okay. Those right. days, yes, those days, and Mr. Bulwan Singh was the magistrate, was the interpreter and commander, chief commander of the PJ court. If you wanted anything done in PJ court, all you have to do is contact Gulwan and he, Gulwan Singh will, was a very nice man. Yeah. He was a pakka gentleman and very helpful, extremely helpful. So my first trial was before one Majid and it was a case of, it could be a case of uh, mistaken identity, you see. And so I went and saw, I, I, every weekend I'll go up to Chuntak's house in Saramban and spend the weekend with him. That was my regular program. Every Saturday I'll go off to spend my weekend with uh, Chuntak. So we went and saw Edgar and I told Edgar, I've got this trial coming up. And Edgar got up and went, walked up and down next to his table, which was littered with paper. Then he came and sat down and said, Din Dayal against King Emperor, AIR 1924, Ud. Right, Page okay. 15, right. <laughs> oh, good Lord. That's it. He, his memory, Edgar Joseph's memory was uh, phenomenal. Even now, I think he is probably, if one looks at all the lawyers I have worked with, the man with the best memory, I think, was Edgar Joseph. So in those early years in practice, you did a mixed bag of work, I, I gather. Criminal. I had no criminal. choice. Yep. Yeah. I did everything that came on my table because I had to pay the rent. I had to pay mm. my staff. And I had to pay $80 for installments for my car. Right. Okay. $80 in a month. A lot of money, you know. $80 a month <laughs> for my sports car. Right. For a sports light car. Right, right. So, was it a... <laughs> A terribly big challenge switching from one area of the law to another because nowadays you know young young lawyers i feel myself have a tendency to over specialize very early on but you uh, seem to have you know go into various sections of the law you see you must remember i was number 211 on the list okay. of lawyers in malaya right so now i don't know they got more than twenty thousand lawyers i'm told that's right of course my view is the law is a very enjoyable subject Raslan. And uh, it's a very intriguing area. You know, it puts your brain to full use, full gear. Uh, there are no, there is no uh, space for errors. You have to engage your brain 100% on any problem that comes to you. So what that did for me was, because I had to, as I told you, for financial reasons, I had to come take on any case that came. And every case, every brief provided a source of funds. That's all. So I was compelled to learn bankruptcy law. I was compelled to learn companies, uh, company law. I was, I came from a, an English common law system where we learned the theft act. And I suddenly I had to switch to the Indian penal code. So I yep. literally had to sit down and do a, a new area altogether. But I was a little, at a little advantage because when I was at screen and when Alex took time off, to holiday or anything, and and and, and uh, Paddy had no briefs to give me. I used to sit down and I sat down and I read the Malayan Law Journal from 1957 to 1969, 68, yeah, 69. I think the volume one. So I read every case. I didn't understand it. I couldn't be bothered. I just read and keep re kept kept reading. So it. Uh, made me not then to realize actually i knew nothing you know i mean i was a real idiot i i come back with a law degree but i knew zero man. i knew nothing right. if you're a zero then the only way to go is up that's right i started le learning the law so i used to go when i went to court for example after i was called to the bar i used to go to court and i would never finish and when my cases finished i never came back I used to sit in court and watch other lawyers argue, especially in the high court. And if you had a case before, if you had a matter before Raja Aslan or, for example, uh, Hamid Omar, 
if you're fortunate enough to have a case before either of them or SS Gill, you know, you really enjoyed listening to the questions being put by the bench to the bar and then the answers being provided. In those days, we didn't have photocopying machines and we had no faxes. The only way of communication was telex. And that, you know, is a, it was a, not a very useful way and not helpful. So we used to take books in, in baskets made for us by yep. the prisoners in Pudu Jail. Yes. I remember going to the late Mr. Ku Eng Chin's office and he's got, he had these long, long baskets where he told me he used to put books in it and he had his assistants carrying a whole load of them in, into court. And I presume that's, and that's why the tradition, I suppose, of, of exchanging authorities comes into play in advance, right? Actually, we used to send the list of authorities to the library, mm. Mr. Yeah. Said, who knew every book in the Supreme Court library, every textbook, every law report he knew. And he was our first source, or rather, he was our first base for source, for legal knowledge. He was very good. And uh, later, Mr. Kamarudin joined him. But he was no, he was a very wonderful man, but he did not have the knowledge base of uh, Said. Said knew everything. So we were very fortunate. We used to send the list of authorities to Said, and then there was no requirement to send a copy of the authorities to the other side. So oh. when I started practice, I found this very difficult because I didn't know what cases the other side was going to cite. So I started serving my list of authorities on the other side. So which made it oh, only re required them <laughs> to give me a copy of their list. Right, right, right. See, you uh, put the feeling of guilt on the other side, you see, by giving yes, it to the yes. list of authorities. That's right, that's right. And that required them to serve it on you. But the original practice was no serving. Oh, I see. Ah, it's, until I came into practice, I said, this is rubbish. I thought to myself, this is nonsense. You know, how can you uh, stand up and answer a case you haven't even read? So I said, all right, we exchange a list of authorities. And then I went to Penang to do a case against Cecil. And we said, let's sit down and compile a single bundle so that we can both of us use it. And if there are any additional authorities, we'll just add. So... We actually put the authorities in a file, in a compilation. Then I found that, you know, it's not convenient to have a file because you can't locate the case easily. So the practice then started of putting it in a bundle as it is now. So later, when uh, Raja Aslan became Chief Justice of, Mal of Malaya, he said uh, it will be a good thing if uh, council can actually exchange bundles. So he started the practice. Raja Aziz and I used to do it all the time. We will always share bundles. So he said, since you cowboys are doing this, better we make it a rule. So he introduced, he introduced it. He was a wonderful judge. He was a very nice man to appear before, as was Hamid Omar and Azmi Kamaruddin. Uh, we were very fortunate because I was very fortunate because I appeared and I trained before judges who were from the generation of people who knew the law. These were men from the service. You take Hashim Yubsani, Raja Aslan, Hamid Omar, Said Osman. All these were men from the service. They hadn't practiced a day at the bar. And yet today, the judgment which sets the benchmark for what is the meaning of a stakeholder, what are the duties of a stakeholder, the judgment of Hashim Yubsani. Yes. On mistaken identity, the judgment of Raja Aslan Shah, where he applied the tribe and tailor for the first time. For, he, for him, he, he, they used to write judgments as if they had been doing it all the time. I mean, as if they, had, they, were, they were from the bar. So it was a great privilege to appear before those kind of judges and very the learning process, how to manage a case. Mm. You had to learn that from Hamid Omar. He used to try 60 running down cases a week. Six zero. <laughs> Monday was the day of fixing of the 60. So he said, I will hear 
And of course, everybody, that no postponements allowed. Yeah. So everyone who couldn't get his act together went and settled. Ah, yes, of course. Settled. Ah, and then his notes of evidence will be only a few pages, two or three pages, uh, because he'll put their plaintiff, PW1, plaintiff, and then he'll say very briefly, uh, and those days they didn't have any witness statements, so it's evidence in chief. So he said, walking along road, walking along the road, full stop, suddenly heard a vehicle approaching. I couldn't, I, after that, I can't remember, full stop. That's evidence in chief, <laughs> right? Dr. Shri, could I just ask, because you've just mentioned that in those days there were no witness statements. I, I think that in those days there were also no written submissions. No, no, written Did submissions were right? forbidden. Forbidden? Forbidden. Oh. If you tender a written submission before Raja Aslan Shah, he'll throw it back at you. <laughs> he, he, you that, know what, that... was his famous, what were his famous words? Gentlemen, I already know how to read. Oh. I want to hear you. <laughs> you see? The same thing with uh, uh, Said Osman. And Said Osman had a ferocious temper. I remember once he threw the Land Acquisition Act at uh, one of the state legal advisors in Joba. But he was a wonderful man. You know? Yeah. Keen sense of humor. Every one of them had a very keen sense of humor. And, you know, I found the judges who came from the bar were intolerable. They had no judicial temperament like me. And then they also had, uh, they also did not know the law very well. So in my first, at the end of my first five years of practice, I formulated two rules. I said, the first rule was all Malays make good judges <laughs> and all non-Malays make bad judges. The only exception to that rule was Gil, because he was a non-Malay. The second rule was, all those who come from the service make good judges. All those who come from the bar make terrible judges. Gill was a non-Malay, but he came under the second rule that all those who come from the service are good judges. The only exception to the second rule was Zahir, Muhammad Zahir. His judicial temperament, unmet, uh, I think, uh, unmatchable. He had such a good judicial temperament. Muhammad Zahir, he later, later became Speaker of the House. He came under the first exception. He came under the first rule. All Malays make good judges. <laughs> yeah, because he was in practice. Uh, as a uh, all right. So he came from the bar, but he was a, still a good judge because he came under the first rule. But those days, the persons, the judges who actually broke that rule were Edgar, Zaidin. So Zaidin was sometimes difficult, but Edgar was never. Pay switching and Shankar, it was a pleasure to appear before these judges, you know, pleasure. And because uh, with Edgar and Shankar, you don't have to cite any law because they knew all the law. Could I ask uh, a, a bit about the, the advocacy uh, that you, you experienced, uh, first as a young lawyer and then later as a more mature counsel? In terms of, because I know you did a fair bit of trial work as well, it's not just uh, on, on appellate matters, etc on preparing for your cases, right? Particularly, say, areas of cross-examination. Do you have prepared questions or do you just merely have areas to go through? And how, how do you generally prepare for your briefs in the trial matter? I found, I tried the first method to write down questions. Didn't work. Because the wretched witness always used to give an answer for which you are not ready, you see. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so I said, all right, then do it topics. Do it by topics. And the person who taught me to do it by topics was Robert Chalaya. And I and I found even Shankar in a trial which I did against Shankar, Shankar did it by topics. So if you if you master your brief and you do it by topics and you've got a note with you on the what are the topics you're going to cover, then the brain automatically tells you where to follow on. The same thing with Raja Aziz. Raja Aziz was a brilliant cross-examiner. I must tell you this about Aziz. You know, he did the Mahesan trial. He did the Mahesan trial. His opponent was Lim Ken Chai. Lim Ken Chai called a witness, Rangasamy, whose evidence was taken the Bene Esse in Madras, before the registrar of the court in Madras. After the witness gave evidence, and Raja Aziz were, had to cross-examine him. After cross-examination, he came and told the, his solicitor, 
who was looking after him in uh, Madras, he said, you know, that lawyer is very angry all the time, very angry with me. And, uh, the other side's lawyer, very angry with me. But this, our side's lawyer is very nice man. So the, his advocate corrected him and said, no, no, no. The man you're complaining about is your lay lawyer. The other side <laughs> man is, is actually the man whom you think is your, your lawyer is actually... My, his, my, you think his, his lawyer is actually the cooperative society's lawyer. Yeah. So, Aziz is so, such a brilliant cross-examiner and never raised his voice. But he got his point across. What was your style? I would presume you'll be more animated than Raja Aziz. Yeah, that comes because of your character. Yeah. If you yeah, have an aggressive course. character, then it comes through. But still, you never, the one thing I never used to say is, I never do, do it even now, is you never say of a witness you're telling lies and things, you know, that you're a liar. Nobody likes to be accused of being a liar. So you don't say that. You say, if you don't agree with his evidence, you say, it's, it's, it's not correct. What you're saying is not correct. I learned that from Rajazis and from Robert Chalaya. Robert Chalaya used to be such a cross-examiner. You have the witness would ask, Sorry, I can't hear you. He was so soft-spoken. But his brilliance was in taking a problem, putting it on a spindle and spinning it. You know, we, as a young lawyer, you, you just concentrate your, your notes of argument with 40, 50 pages, you know, which are all repetitions. Robert Chalaya will take the same problem, put it on a spindle, and spin it around and he look at it from all angles. And I used to be amazed at his ability to do that because my vision was only two-sided, you see. My side and the other side. My side argument and the other side. side. But he could actually look at it, look at the problem as a whole and discover areas which ordinarily would not be visible to a person with limited vision like me. So I learned that from him. And he was a very kind man. Robert Chalaya was like a candle. You know, it gave light. When, when you appeared before, say, say, uh, you know, judges, which, which shall we say, have issues with judicial temperament. I mean, the, the you know, and how, how will you handle them? I mean, I've read, um, you know, uh, anecdotes of old, advocates actually staring down judges and telling judges you are paid to listen so you're just going to have to sit there quietly and listen to me uh, I, I I cannot imagine nowadays any advocate daring to say that to, to judges what was your experience at the bar when when say when you came up they say I mean you know Justice Yusufi Abdul Qadir can't be easy and, and how do you do handle judges like that Abdul Qadir by being aggressive because he was actually a coward you know, if you, as you say, if you stare him down, he'll back off. I'll give you a, a good example. Not mine, but a very close friend of mine, uh, Sunny. His brother was a doctor. He was a Chinese uh, lawyer. Uh, he was my senior by three years. I met him when I arrived in London. He was a very kind man. We all called him as Sunny. His first name will come to me in a moment. When Yusufi went after him in a particular case, he stood up and gave it back to him. He said, will you stop saying that? What are you trying to suggest? He told, and you be backed off. You see, you never, you see, you, you don't do that to lawyers. You can criticize their argument, but don't attack them personally, you see. The trouble with people like uh, S.M. Young and Yusufi is they attack people personally. In fairness to him, I think Chang Min Tat to a much lesser extent. It's so much easier appearing before Chang Min Tat. Of course, as we used to say, Chang Min Tat's uh, mouth did not contain saliva. It, uh, it ran uh, sulfuric acid. <laughs> His tongue was soaked in sulfuric acid, not saliva. <laughs> he was Oxford trained. He was Oxford right. trained, trained. So sarcasm with him was a way of life. All right, right. So who was the most difficult judge you've appeared before? S.M. Young. Mm. S.M. Young, the trouble with S.M. Young is he did not know any law, but insisted that he did. Right. And he was a very difficult man. He and Joginder Singh never hit it off. 
and he I used to attack Joginder personally, which I thought was very, I mean, uh, distasteful. I found it distasteful. And Joginder was such a wonderful person, you know. Joginder Singh is such a wonderful human being. So uh, calm and collected and extremely courteous. Azmi Kamarudin liked him a lot. Aslan used to like Joginder, but for some reason, SM Young didn't like him at all. And for the same reason, probably he didn't like me. The other person was very difficult, but who was a very good lawyer, who was a very clever lawyer, brilliant lawyer, was uh, H.T. Young. Mm. In H.T. Young's case, our relationship was one of uh, dislike and hatred. He disliked me, I hated him. Okay. And, and so when you appeared before these this judges, knowing fully well this is going to be a hard, long day in court, how's the mindset then of, of Gopal Sri Ram going to battle with these sort of judges? That's where my mother's instinct came to me. All right. What I inherited from I couldn't be bloody bothered. You know? Right. I must tell you this. When I was reading in chambers, I took some time off for two weeks, which we are entitled, we were entitled to do those days. Your ma people must have give you two weeks off. So I went to Singapore to visit my friend and my mentor, Raja Tampuran. He was a partner in a firm called Wu and Raja. Both of them were very close friends. And Raja was actually my guide and my mentor when I was in London. He looked after me. And he taught me how to learn law. So I owe if I'm a, if I was if I passed all my law exams, I think all the thanks goes to the late Raja Tampuran. And uh, Sedu, Sedu, you know, RR Sedu, he used to worship Raja. So I went to visit Raja in, in Singapore and he introduced me to S.T. Chung. And S.T. Chung told me, come along, Sri Ram, I'm going to go to court this morning on an appeal from uh, a district court. Come and listen. And uh, when he went there, it was before Wee Chong Jin, it was in the old court. And uh, Lee Chong Jin came up and those days court shall said at sharp 10.30 in Singapore. Sharp 10.30 they'd sit. The Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice's court, which used to hear subordinate appeals, subordinate court appeals. In the middle of the appeal, I can't remember what it was about. I think it was a landlord and tenant dispute. For some unknown reason, not immediately apparent to anyone, I think, Lee Chong Jin went after S.T. Chung and was rather rude to him. So S.T. Chung stood up. He used to be wigged. You know, those days the barristers in Singapore used to wear wigs. So he was wigged and he said, My Lord, your Lordship is king of this, of, of, of within these four walls. But you are just an ordinary human being outside. You must remember that. So stop being rude to me. I cannot argue this case with you in this frame of mind. If you want, you can hear this case ex parte. I'm grieving. He packed his brief and he turned around and told me, Sri Ram, come, let's go. And we left. Ooh. The next day, at about 9.30, when I was having coffee with ST, there was a phone call from Lee Chong Jing's secretary saying that he wanted ST to appear before him in open court at 10.30. So ST asked him, what for? Why should I appear before him? So the secretary said, I don't know, sir. But the chief, chief is asking for you. So he went. It was a crowded court. And Wee Chong Jin walked in at 10.30. The case was called up. And he said, Mr. Chung, I have asked you to come today because I want to apologize to you in the presence of all the bar. I think my conduct yesterday was uncalled for. I freely apologize to you. Please accept my apology. What do you think of that? Wow, oh, that's that's. That's the mark of a man, isn't it? Yes, that was me, Chong Jin. That was Chong Jin. But it shows you the mark of the lawyer also. That's right. That's right. Him, Look, you're only king of these within these four walls. Outside this, you're an ordinary human being. That's right. I mean, it takes a certain kind of advocates as well to stand up to, to judges like that, particularly because the concern will always be, if I do this, am I hurting my client's case? Right? And, and so... There's always that tension, uh, that the street. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So when you were in practice, did you face that kind of, you know, if I were to go after this judge, then what will happen to my client's case? 
right? I didn't have that choice to make, Razran, because most of my practice was before easygoing judges, Harun Hashim, Azmi Kamaruddin, Said Osman, Ibrahim Manan. Ibrahim Manan was a gem. You know, I was acting for an insurance company. I went to national insurance. I went, this was in 1971. I went to Kuala Tranganu. Those days we had the monsoon judges. So in the monsoon, the northeast monsoon, the judge from Kotabaru used to cover Kwantan and Johor. And then in the southwest monsoon, the Johor judge would cover Kwantan, Kuala Tranganu and Kotabaru. So, but then for the first time in 1971, they posted a judge in Kotabaru and it happened to be Ibrahim Manan. And he would cover Kotabaru and Kuala Tranganu. And my case was before him in Kuala Tranganu. Kade Musa's father was the interpreter. We could never find him. Forever he'd be missing, you know, because without the interpreter, the court cannot sit. Eventually he turned up and then he said, the judge wants to see you all in chambers. So I went in. Those days I used to smoke. And there was Ibrahim Anand relaxed in his chair, having his coffee and his uh, Rothmans, Palma. And he said, uh, he told me, Sriram, do you smoke? I said, yes, my Lord, I do. Well, feel free to do so. Look, I will tell you something. No plaintiff leaves my court without something in his pocket. In a, okay. a running down case. Right. Okay, in a personal injury, in a personal injury claim, I must tell you, my philosophy is that no plaintiff leaves my court without something. So can you get some instructions to settle this? I said, I have to call the client who was the manager of the national insurance company, Mr. Ramachandra. So, sorry, Mr. Padmanathan. So, I picked up the phone. I said, I, I have to go and make a call. There's no bar room, nothing in the old Tranganu court, you see. So he said, no, use my phone. So I picked up his phone and dad rang Padmanan and said, look, I'm in the judge's chambers. The judges asked, him, asked us to make an offer. So can you give us, can you give me instructions to put some figure to... Li Lengguan was my opponent. Right, okay. Wonderful chap. Li Lengguan was a wonderful man. So uh, I said, can you... Give me a figure that I think he oh, the offer was 1500 or something, you know, and uh, I think it was uh, $500 costs. So I put the offer to Li Lengguan, and uh, Ibrahim Manan said, You make it $1,400 and $600 costs. Okay. I said, Yes, I leave that. So he told Li Lengguan, There, you've got your $600 costs, you tell your client to take $1,400. Because in the East Coast, they never took any fee from the client those days. Right. Only the cost they took. The client would get all the damages, only the cost the lawyers would take. So he uh, says, you got your $600, which was a lot of money those days in the right. East Coast. And he said, the matter is resolved. And then he used to go off. And then he entered consent judgment in chambers and that was it. Aslan had a much better way of doing it. I did. I was doing a wrongful dismissal case before him. I was assisting uh, Jokinder. He wrote a judgment, but it's not reported. Called Ranjit Singh against St. Gabriel's School. Uh, he dismissed our claim, of course. But what everybody didn't know was this. Before he wrote the judgment, in the middle of the case, Jokinder left the cross-examination of the defendant to me. Because you see, in, in a, I must tell you this. In a wrongful dismissal case, in those days, the master has to give evidence first. Because the burden is on the master to prove that the dismissal was to justify the dismissal. So since the burden of proof, the legal burden was on the master, he has to start the case. So in the middle of my cross-examination of the principal, I said, was this issue put to the board? And he said, yes, it was. And this is where I say you make mistakes in cross-examination. I should have left it like that. Hmm. But what I did was I said, but there is no resolution before the court. He says, no, I don't have a copy of the resolution, but if I'm given time, I will produce it. So Aslan then adjourned the case to the following day. And we went before him. And the boy, this gentleman produced the board, what he called the, the minutes book in which the dismissal of Mr. Ranjit Singh was discussed. Because it was a term of Ranjit Singh's contract that the board must make the decision. 
The board ah, was deciding. Okay. Uh, so the justification was being proved. And uh, our opponent was Chin Yun Chong from Screen, another very thorough gentleman. So Chin Yun Chong uh, called this boy, this gentleman back, and he put the, the uh, minute book to him. Right. Yeah. So immediately after the minute book was introduced, this was about 11.30 in the morning, because Aslan used to sit at about 11 only. So 11.30, uh, he adjourned and he said, no, no, I'm going to take a, I want to adjourn this matter for a few minutes. Then he adjourned. Netta was his uh, interpreter. And Netta came out and said, the judge wants to see you all in chambers. So we walked in. There was Joginder, myself and uh, Chin Yun Chong. So sorry, it was Petty. Because uh, on the first day Chin appeared, the second day Petty appeared with Chin. So he told he said, Stanley, you know, this man has worked for this school for 30 over years and you're all going to just sack him without anything? Give him something. So Benny said, okay, I'll go and talk to them. Can I have a day? He said, no problem. We'll come back tomorrow. So he went there. Of course, those days, if a trial is fixed, it just goes on until the, it gets finished. There's no uh, adjournment to another date. And all. So we came back the next day. Aslan had some matters in chambers. He finished very quickly, as it was his style. We were before him at 11 o'clock in the morning. And Petty, we went into chambers and Petty said, uh, I've got instructions to offer up to uh, offer up to $25,000 or something. He put some figure, you know. Aslan, of course, knew Joginder from his student days in London. Because Aslan's wife and Joginder were classmates at uh, Brinsford. He told Joginder, Hey, Bai, you better accept that. <laughs> okay. So, Joginder said, yes, because I told, I told Joginder before we went into chambers, we won't get a penny in this case if you, if we, unless uh, the judge, judge twists this one's hands to, arms to give us something, arm is to give us something. So, he gave 20,000 or something. I can't remember the exact figure. Which worked out to uh, three months salary over the 35 years he had worked. Well, it's about three months per year times 30. We went back into open court. And the moment the court said, I stood up and said, My Lord, I'm very pleased to inform your Lordship that the matter has been settled. Settled? Settled? I thought this was going to be fought. <laughs> so, Christ, I'm, I'm completely shocked. So, what is the figure, uh, Mr. Sriram? So, he said, My Lord, uh, we have agreed that the defendant will pay the, plaint will pay the plaintiff 30,000 ringgit and costs of 2000 or whatever it is. That's very strange. He said, that's the precise amount I was having in my mind. Said, Obviously, you, both lawyers, when it went by, you were able to read my mind. I'm very pleased to hear this. Of course, it comes to us as a complete surprise to me. He said, yes. and he recorded the judgment and went off. So that was Aslan. <laughs> that's why I said, it was a great pleasure appearing before these people. Yeah, that's right. That's Even right. Gil, Gil was very pro prosecution. You couldn't win a case before him uh, on appeal. And when he was Chief Justice, he used to hear all the subordinate court criminal appeals. And I used to tell Edgar Joseph, you're just banging your head against the bloody wall. In. You know, because on the other hand, if you had somebody like Said Osman, you had a very fair chance because Said Osman was very fair. H.S. Song was very fair. Mm. H.S. Song was another brilliant judge, but he was not like his brother, you know. He was not acerbic. He was much more easy to appear before, more pleasant. H.S. of course had a drinking problem. He was, uh, he had a drinking problem, but nevertheless, he was a brilliant lawyer. Between the brothers, I thought he was a much cleverer lawyer. And you know, he was a solicitor general. He came from the bar, then he went to join the service and he became the, became the solicitor general. And then from solicitor general, he became a judge. So he was a very good man. And he said, he used to, he, those days, federal court judges used to come down and hear high court matters to relieve the judges of the burden. So uh, he sat at first instance on a bail application. My client, an elderly lady, was accused of murder. Oh. And I made an application to the re chief registrar. At that time, it was uh, Anwar Zain Labidin by letter to have the prosecution produce the murder weapon. The murder weapon happened to be a huge uh, 
hammer, massive hammer. So I said, my Lord, I want to make an application to your Lordship to ask the accused to see whether she can lift the murder weapon. So he says, yes, I'll allow it. So my opponent was Lamin, the deputy public prosecutor. Yeah. So uh, he told the old lady to come out of the dock and lift the, this massive hammer. And she couldn't. She couldn't lift it. And she's supposed to have taken this hammer and killed the uh, victim by delivering four or five blows. So H.S. Ong said, just to show my contempt for this charge, I'm going to <laughs> allow the uh, accused bail on own recognizance of $100. My goodness. Uh, <laughs> for, the contempt, for the contempt I have for this charge. And then he looked at the deputy and said, Deputy, you know what to do. So Ramin said, I know what to do, madam. Those days, the DPP is also a gentleman. I know what to do. Madam. So when I walked out, Ramin said, OK, we'll withdraw the charge. You can go home. So Dr. Sri, to, to follow on with that, uh, since that was a murder, I know, and don't, I, I know you did murder cases before jury trials and all that. I, I just have two questions. Number one, was the advocacy style different before a jury? And number two, uh, at the end of the day, it's a capital offence. Did it put additional pressure on you as an advocate? See, I'll answer the first question. Advocacy before the jury trial, before a jury is very different from advocacy before a single judge. In an advocacy before the jury, you have to appeal to their emotions. It's emotive. I'll give you an example. There was a jury ad advocate in England, I can't remember his name, who refused to do uh, non-jury cases. But he was compelled, uh, due to certain circumstances, to do this non-jury trial before a judge called Justice Swift. And he began his submission and then he became very emotional about the case. So Justice Swift said, but you know, Mr. Smith, there is no jury here. You don't have to get emotional. You are addressing me alone. Swift, this lawyer apologized and carried on. After some time, he became emotional again. So Justice Swift said, Mr. Smith, I've already told you there is no jury. I'm sitting alone. You don't have to get emotional. And he's apologized again. And then he carried on. The third time it happened again. And Justice Swift told the master of the court, Mr. Master, please turn on the light above the jury box. Mr. Smith doesn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so that is, the, uh, 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 that is the example that I was given when I was a law student. When I attended a uh, talk, after, after dinner talk. And the person who gave me the, the gave us the talk was a lawyer who was appearing for the other side against before Swift. And he said, it's, this is the jury, non-jury. So if, between a jury trial and a non-jury trial, advocacy in a jury trial is very, very different. And you have to show the jury that there is a reasonable doubt. And you have to do it systematically. You see? Before a judge, you don't have to appeal to his uh, sentiments because a judge is not influenced by sentimentality. He is influenced by the law and the facts. So in that way, we just uh, summarize our case and tell the judge what it is very simply. This is my case. This is my learned friend's case. So I say my case is so should succeed for these reasons and that my learned friend's case should fail for the same reasons. So you put it that way, then the, it, the judge makes it uh, it's easier for him. You can't do that with a jury. There's your second question, if I remember, about the, I think you said about the... The pressure, the additional pressure. Yeah, additional pressure. See, when your first first time your client hangs, you feel bad. After that, you get used to it. Rasan, at the end of the day, you and I, Michelle and everybody here who's listening, <clears throat> we are just paid gladiators. We just perform for our client what our client could have done had he or she known the law. That's all. 
So we are here to perform a play a, to perform a task which we do our, to the best of our ability, without being unfair to anyone, without uh, misleading any any uh, either your opponent or the or the court. You just do your best. But the case determine it, determines its strength by its own facts. You cannot improve a bad case, and you cannot spoil a very good case because a good case will win on the facts. It doesn't need anybody. So we are just there to to help the court achieve the right answer on the facts. So if it's a death penalty, what to do? You see. After they abolished juries, I didn't do any drug cases because drug cases were not tried before juries. Yes. So in my entire practice, I didn't do a single drug case. When I went on the bench, I was completely ignorant about any provision of the Dangerous Drugs Act 1952. So I told Lamin when he was president, I said, from because I don't know anything about dangerous drugs, I want to sit as the junior most judge in every drug appeal that comes before the court of appeal for the next one year. And I want to write the judgment so that my brothers can correct me where I'm going wrong. <clears throat> you see what I mean? And I used to insist on sitting with people like Zakaria Yatim and uh, Sheikh Dao. So I would sit as the winger and then I would send my judgment to Sheikh Dao. And Sheikh, of course, knew the dangerous drugs the, the propositions of law uh, by heart. So Sheikh used to correct, correct me, you see? And uh, that's how I learned it. So you will see 95, 96, 97 also some, I used to quite, write quite a few judgments. Some of them I got terribly wrong, I think, but the federal court corrected me. So that was really, sorry, and then, uh, to, to more recent events, you, of course, still currently acts as a prosecutor now, prosecuting uh, uh, several high-profile criminal matters. In terms of mindset, your mindset as an advocate, is it any different from being a defense advocate? Or is it a completely different way of approaching the matter? Yes, it is. For this reason, as a prosecutor, you have to ensure that you need, you have evidence in your brief which will prove every element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. That is, you must ensure that otherwise the prosecution will not succeed. So yeah. your experience will tell you whether the ingredient is satisfied or not. Your experience and training will tell you, like uh, if there is, for example, take the simple example of a criminal breach of trust case. I have to prove that the accused was entrusted with property or dominion over property. Now, it's easier to prove dominion than to prove entrustment of actual entrustment of property. So you would frame the charge with entrusted with dominion over property rather than entrusted with property so that your burden becomes is not that high. Secondly, I have to prove that the property was put to a use other than the use to which the true owner intended it to be put. Yep. If I can, I have to establish that through a through stages, step by step. So I have to call the true owner of the property. I have to prove the entrustment of the dominion. Then I have to prove the purpose for which the property was given. Now that's not always easy because. Uh, directors of a company are entrusted with the dominion of the company's property. But mm. they are also governed by the articles of association and by resolutions of the board. So sometimes people say, well, there is no resolution and therefore this must be CBT. That's not correct. Because mm. the articles may themselves provide for the power in that director to have done what he did. Yep. So one has to look at the articles, one has to look at the uh, resolution. See, if the articles are silent, then if there's no resolution, prima facie, the owner did not consent. There is an old case, I can't remember the citation, but it is called Nauroji against Emperor. It's a decision of the High Court of Burma. High Court of, yes, High Court uh, in Rangun. In that case, 
the test they laid down was that if you use a property for a purpose other than the purpose for which it was given to you, that use is prima facie dishonest. So if you can prove this element, you prove, if you prove this ingredient, you also prove the ingredient of dishonesty. If, you, if I can show that the property has been put to a use other than the use for which it was meant, I establish conversion, which is misappropriation. I also establish dishonesty under section 24. So if you learn, if you know all these rules, then you put the evidence forward and then if they cross-examine to show that, for example, that there was no entrustment, then your job is to to fill in the gaps. Right. I suppose then it's a, it's a much tougher proposition prosecuting rather than defending. Yes. First, the decision to prosecute. It must be unanimous among our, all the, our DPPs and on a brief to the AG that it is prosecutable of a, it is a case to prosecute. So unless we are unanimous, it's very difficult. Because every one of the DPPs will have a question. What about this? What about this? What about this? So unless, and if, if you're the team leader, you have to show, satisfy your fellow team members that there are no gaps left. And if in your own mind you think there's a gap, then it's safer not to prosecute. I give you a simple example, Razlan. I was given a task of determining whether we should prosecute a case of money laundering, concerned a lawyer. Looking at the evidence, I came to the conclusion that the lawyer did not know the source of number one, was not aware of the source of the funds that came into his, into his hands and went into his client's account. Number two, of course, we can prove that it is the product of unlawful means. Yeah. But the amount involved was one, one or two million dollars. So my uh, recommendation was don't prosecute because you're going to ruin the career of a lawyer. You're going to ruin the firm in which he is working. What does it benefit does it produce to the public when there are so many other cases here where you have large sums of money being laundered. And this is a small amount on which the lawyer on the brief before on the statements recorded, I was satisfied, was not aware. And he did not do anything unlawful. For example, he did not take the money from the client and uh, put it in the name of a different person. Mm, yes. There was one case where a, a lawyer uh, took money from A and then put it in his client's account as if the money had come from B. In other words, to, to, to uh, conceal the, the true owner of the money. Of course, that is, that is the definition of uh, money laundering, you see. That's right. So that is not the case in which I was, that is not the brief I was given. So the advice we had to give the Attorney General was, in, and of course in writing, I said, I recommend no prosecution in this case because you're going to ruin a man's career for nothing. How, do I, how is the public interest uh, uh, served? Mm. So those are decisions, important decisions. But my, my training as a judge helped me make that decision. Ah, right. Yes, coming to that. Dr. Sri, we have spoken for over an hour now. I, I've now come to the what we call, Michelle and I call, the rapid-fire questions, right? It's just uh, um, a bit of fun we do towards the end of, of our interview. I hope I've not been too locations. No, no, Dr. Sri, of course not. Could, could I just ask you uh, very quickly, if you, weren't an if you weren't an advocate, what would you be? I'd have been a mathematics teacher. I'd have been a very happy mathematics teacher. Right. And what do you enjoy most in practice? The intellectual exercise, the law, I suppose, or the interpersonal skills, the challenge of cross-examination and dealing with judges? I find my, I, I find my interaction with my, my fellow lawyers the most... I think the most enjoyable. And who was the opponent you respected the most? Raja Aziz. Who did you learn most from? Robert Chalaya. Which judge challenged you the most? Which judge challenged me the most? Zakaria Yatim. And if there's a case you want to go back and re-argue, what would that case be? 
argue. I think uh, I can't think of any. Sorry, Rasman, because I either made a good uh, decision and argued it well, or I made such a hash of it that I can't do anything <laughs> better than what I. Do. All right, <laughs> then I'll have an alternative question. Which of the case that you've argued, and we could be recent, could be in the past, could be recently, that stands out for you most? Argued stands out for me for the most, not in Johan. My client who was uh, co-accused in the Mokta Hashim murder trial. Right, right. Why, 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 why of all the cases, was that, that, that's the one that evoked such feelings in you? I had a very, very good, but extremely bright, but very fair prosecutor in Abu Talib. And he was a master of the law of evidence and pro criminal procedure. So I had a, a very tough opponent. I had a very courteous and very learned trial judge in Hashim Yobsani and a man eminent with eminent fairness. And I had with me uh, my juniors who were of immense help to me. Uh, Zulkifli Rafik was one of them. So he was, he helped me a lot. So the other thing is that the case itself involved five or six major propositions. For the first time, we were going to apply Satpal uh, against Delhi administration, a case which was not cited before the judge, trial judge. <clears throat> that is the right to cross-examine a witness who is under impeachment. Secondly, the case had to do with section 34 of the penal code on common intention. And I came to know all, learn all my law on common intention from Hashim Yubsani. He actually, through the trial, during the trial, taught me, I would say, taught me what common intention was. I mean, he was a master teacher. So I learned that from him. So I'm grateful to him for that. That is the reason I remember it also. And also section 30 of the Evidence Act, evidence of a co-accused. Confession, sorry, confession of a co-accused, which he also, he taught me. So for those reasons, I learned a lot from that case. Therefore, I remember it very well. I had a very strong prosecutor, but very fair man. Abu Talib was a very, very relentless prosecutor, but a very fair one. He will never conceal evidence from you. And number two, he will never put a case which he cannot prove. Who have you not been able to go up against, but would like to have to? I would like to go up against Yusuf mm. Abdul Kader. Okay. Right. In your view, what is the most important quality in an advocate? Mm, patience. Patience? Number one, the number of patience. You have to be very patient. You have to be patient with your client. Number two, you have to be patient with the judge. And nowadays, I'm very sad to say we don't have the kind of judges we had those days. Some, most of our judges, our um, high court judges are very good. I mean, I, the people I've appeared against, I'll give you a few. I'll name a few. You know, uh, Ahmad Fayrus, he's brilliant. Uh, you know, he's extremely quick on the uptake. The second one, I can tell you, was very quick on the uptake, Ong Chi Kwan. Very pleasant man to appear before, very quick on the uptake. There are several others. I can't, just because I don't mention them doesn't mean I'm, I intend to omit them by intention. Yes, yes. Azizul. Azizul is a very, very uh, clever man. But um, I'm critical of the way he writes judgments. I'm critical of the way he writes that. But that is uh, style. It will come eventually. And uh, Zaini Mazlou. He's excellent. He's excellent. Very quick on the uptake. Colin Sequeira is very quick on the uptake. He can spot the point. He can see you coming from miles away. So Zaini also is the same. When you start submitting, he's already seen where, your, where the conclusion is. So he's very fast. There are a few of the others. Some of them are, of course, not familiar with the law of evidence. These boys and girls, the other one I've appeared, a very pleasant person to appear before is the former legal advisor of Penang, Haja Aliza. I, I've known her as Aliza because I knew her when she was a legal advisor of Penang. She's very bright and she is quality. To, she's a person you should train to send her quickly to the Court of Appeal. Then all these people I'm talking about. The other one is uh, K.K. Wong. He's also very bright, but he's very loquacious. 
Yes. And uh, that might not be helpful because uh, if you are in the court of appeal, you can be locations. But for a trial judge, my advice is if your mouth is itching, scratch it. Don't open it, use it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that, that's the three. I'll use it myself on some of these judges I appeared before. <laughs> Please do that. And then, uh, you see, silence is the, is the hallmark of a trial judge. Right. Okay. In the okay. Court of Appeal, Court of Appeal, you can be locations because uh, the rule in the Court of Appeal is uh, first two minutes of silence and then the ball is delivered. First ball is delivered. Right. Right. It's like the Privy Council. Privy Council, you get three minutes of silence. Hmm. Right to silence is three minutes and then comes the first ball from any one of the three or five as the case may be. Right. And I found the appearing before the Privy Council, comprising of English judges. English judges are very rude. Mm. We used to call them Diplock's gang. Yeah. And they, they, that gang comprised of Diplock, Bridge, Bright, uh, Brightman, Templeman. And uh, who else was there? Yeah, those are the fellows. And they were very, very rude. But the Scottish judges, pleasure before to appear before. Keith. Keith was not a great lawyer. I must tell you that. Keith mm. of uh, King, King Kale was not a great yeah. lawyer. Fraser, uh, Fraser was. Mm. I've appeared before Fraser. Not a very bright lawyer. Not a very clever lawyer. Diplock was clever, but very rude and very very racist. Bridge made uh, attack one of my friends when he was appearing before the uh, appellate committee in the House of Lords, and I thought his behaviour was completely injudicious. Uh, but other than that, I found my experience in the Privy Council was that appearing before the Scottish judges was very great pleasure. And my misfortune was the man who actually, whom I admired, I never had a chance to appear before him, Wilberforce. Mm, mm. And uh, I never had an opportunity to appear before Reed. Look at my luck. I used to appear at the Privy Council and committee room one will be Chad by Reed, and my case would be before Diplock and his back gang in committee room yeah. number two. That's right, that's right. Uh, right. So I never appear, got to appear before Reed. Reed was a, but I've seen him in action. Very good judge. Talk about judicial temperament. Lord Sumption told us that the problem with Diplock was he read case law as if it was statute, and he read statute as if it was precedent. That was the problem yes. with him. I think that's a very fair statement. And uh, I can quote Lord Neil who, of Bladen, a very good friend of mine. He said the trouble with Diplock was that uh, he thought he was clever when he wasn't. <laughs> yes. Actually, he yes. wasn't. He never won a prize at Oxford. Whereas uh, Neil and uh, some of the others won all the prizes. Here. But among the English judges, the more friendly one was Griffith. Griffith was very nice. Hugh Griffith. So, okay, Dr. Sri, sorry. Coming back to the uh, question. So, if you could go back in time, what would you say to the young Sri Ram who's just about to start uh, his own practice? What would, you, what, you, what would you tell him? Learn the law. Don't walk around thinking that you know the law. Actually, you don't. The truth is, you don't know. Sri Ram, you better take, you better uh, grow up understanding this. You don't know anything. Huh? You better start learning it. That's what I'll tell him. And then learn some, learn, learn to be humble. By that answer, could I take it to mean that when, when you were a young lawyer, you actually thought you knew a lot? Yes. That's the, that's the problem I suffered from. But I corrected myself because I realized I didn't know. You see, the learning process teaches you that, Rasla. I take a simple case. Can a, can a person who has obtained his letters of administration but not extracted them bring an action? Yes, yes. A huge amount, I did a huge, a huge amount of research and came to the conclusion, looked at the authorities and came to the conclusion that, yes, they can't do that. All right? When I took all my research and showed it to Robert Chalaya, he opened his book, little book, 
And he said, look at this case, which was not in part of my research. It was a Privy Council decision from Canada. And I opened it. There was a sentence which said very clearly that an administrator does not take title until his letters of administration are vested in him. In other words, until they are extracted. So all my research of way came to nothing with just, I could have just done it with one case. That was Robert's forte. He will win his appeal by referring to one or two authorities. No, nothing more than that. He will never, he wasn't, not, wasn't like V.K. Palasundaram. V.K. Palasundaram will besiege the court with huge amounts of authorities. You know, for one proposition, he'll cite five cases. You know, but Robert will cite one case for three propositions. Maybe you'll get more costs if you do that, uh, Dr. Sri. I don't know. But I found, uh, <laughs> I've always thought, you know, the late fr friend Arnand had a saying put up uh, in front on the bench, which was inherited by Edgar Joseph. It says, brevity is the soul of wit. Yes, that's right. That's right. Right, Dr. Sri, final question. What is it, a typical day, your, your typical day as an advocate, say, if you have a case, uh, you know, that morning, how, how would they, they, they start? Would, you, would, it, would they start really early at 5 a.m. reviewing some of the authorities again? Or you know, how, do, how do you do it? What's, what's the typical Gopal Sri Ram day if he has a case at the federal court? Uh, I'll be thinking about the case all the time, Rasra. From the few days before the case itself, I'll be thinking, and then the whole night also I'll be thinking about it. And sometimes, you know, you won't believe this. The human body is such, the brain is such, that the best idea, ideas turn up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning in the middle of your sleep. It was a, it's a thought that actually should have occurred to you on the first day that you prepared the submissions. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, you know, I, I, like many other lawyers, suffer from apparent ingenuity, you know. <laughs> That means your brain becomes active on the morning of the appeal. <laughs> Only then. But you see, a person, you compare me with somebody like Cyrus. Cyrus is always prepared. Cyrus Das is one of the finest lawyers I've ever met. And he is always prepared. He's never, he, no bench has ever caught him unprepared. He's always been able to answer the questions and deal with the problem. You may not agree with his views or his submissions. I mean, that's your job because you're on the other side. But the way he puts his case, I think he's very thorough. I'm not like that. I'm not like Cyrus. I don't work as hard as him. He does. He's very hardworking. I'm a lazy fellow. Get me to work is impossible. My mother used to tell me I'm very lazy. I think I agree with her. So I think for a lazy fellow, the answer is you find a do your best to find the easiest route to get the correct answer in. That's the advantage of laziness. Whereas a man like Cyrus is much more hardworking. We have a very good team of young and upcoming lawyers. I've seen some of them in court. They're very good. Unfortunately, many of them now, you see, Rasan, we were taught that you must introduce your own juniors as your learned friend. I appear to, together with my learned friend, Mr. K.Y. Chu for the appellant. They don't say that. They say, I appear for the appellant with uh, so-and-so. That's it. So, it's not as if your, your junior is not your learned friend, is it? He's not, neither learned nor your friend. Yes, yes I suppose not. <laughs> that seems to be the modern way of doing things. Uh, that's history, right? We shouldn't do that. We should be respectful. Advocates, as I said, they say, you know, I humbly submit. They used to tell me, I said, don't be, don't say that. Advocates are never humble. They are arrogant. They are arrogant. But they are respectful. Right. You see? Yes. You can say, I, I respectfully submit. But don't say, I humbly submit. We are advocates. We are never humble. Yes, <laughs> Humility is not the hallmark of an advocate. And on that note, Gopal Sri Ram, thank you very much for, for talking to us. We have extended our time, but I suppose our listeners won't be complaining. So thank you so much for being here with us on Advocates, the podcast. Thank you, Dr. Sri. Thank you. And uh, Aslan, 
I don't think I have said anything out of out of place. If no, I have, no, no, no. I should I should say I should uh, suffer the consequences. So don't bother sending <laughs> me the copy of this uh, recording okay, no or then. editing. Okay, you can publish no it worries. as it is. I will no face the consequences. Thank you for listening to Advocates the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to follow us on all our social media channels. Leave a review or share this episode and tag us. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you. Listen to the voices of the advocate.